Well, good morning, everybody. It's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, I spend most of my time these days talking to faculty and to senior administrators, so I feel I'm in amongst friends, at least at the start of this uh, presentation. How I, how I, whether I'll still be you'll still be friends when I finish, we'll, we'll see. So we're, talk we're talking about leadership in learning technologies. What does it mean? Well, rather than give a philosophical discussion of leadership, I thought I'd encapsulate it in a story. Um, there's this man in a hot air balloon, and he's lost. So he look, lets the air out and comes down to about 50 feet above the ground and sees a man jogging along on the, on the road. So he calls down and says, excuse me, can you tell me where I am? And the guy on the ground looks up and says, you're, you're about 50 feet above the ground. And the guy in the balloon shouts down, you must be an IT support person. He said, yes, I am. He said, how do you know that? He says, well, what you've told me is totally accurate and absolutely of no use whatsoever. And the guy on the ground says, well, you must be a university president. He said, well, yes, I am. How did you know that? He says, well, you're totally lost. You're going in the wrong direction, and suddenly it's all my fault. <laughs> so, so, what do we mean by leadership? I then, I'm going to give you a quick overview. Yes, herding cats, it can be done. Um, but what do we mean by, so I'm going to talk about what we mean by leadership, goals and direction, planning and strategic thinking, governance, resource management, dealing with institutional culture, and conclusions. This is all about learning technologies, mind you, not just general leadership. Why managing learning technology is important? It's not a side issue anymore. Um, for most institutions, it's now moving to the center from being somewhat peripheral. The effective use of learning technologies are key to innovation in teaching, uh, productivity, and I'll talk a bit more about productivity later on, um, 21st century skills development, and all the things around blended, flexible, lifelong learning all depend on uh, managing learning technologies well. Um, and also, all this requires, to get technology used properly, we all know it requires major changes in teaching and culture. So it's quite a challenge for leaders in this area. Um, what do we know about managing learning technologies? Well, there's very little written about this. Terry Anderson, and I can never remember the, the Zawacki Richter, is it, I think, wrote an article where they went through the major journals in online and distance education and found less than 10% of the publications were about management and leadership and planning and so on. Um, so one of the things that prompted me, I, I supervised Albert Sangrath's thesis. And he, he took f uh, six case studies in s southern Europe and looked at how they were introducing technology into their institutions. And I was so struck by how similar his results were to my experience that I found another six case studies, uh, five case studies in North America, and we put the two together and worked out what worked and what didn't in terms of um, planning and managing technology. And since that book came out, that's this book here, um, since that book came out, I mean, most of those case studies, they were quite long. For one institution, it will be over possibly a 10-year period up to about 2009 when we started writing this up. And since then, there's been some changes. Um, things are getting better, actually. More institutions are now doing serious learning technology planning. Uh, yesterday, I was at the Board of Governors of the University of Ottawa, where they presented their e-learning plan to the governors. And it was a very good plan, incidentally. Um, and UBC has come out with a massive uh, program called the Flexible Learning In Initiative, which is the result of about six months planning from the very top of the institution right through. Um, what's driving this are two things. Um, MOOCs have spooked um, boards of governors. They want to know why their institutions aren't doing online learning. And it's particularly spooked University of Toronto and some of the more elite universities who hadn't done very much in online learning up to this point. Um, the other thing is government, and particularly in Ontario. The Ontario government has been showing showed quite a lot of leadership in asking for mandate statements from all the universities and specifically asked what do they plan to do about online learning. So 
So there is a push now, a recognition that um, learning technologies are important, online learning is important, and institutions are now thinking about how they should plan for that. So drawing on the results from the book and more recent experience, uh, here are some conclusions. And you all know this chart. We have changing modes of delivery from face-to-face -face classroom through to hybrid to fully online. Now, that raises a challenge for every instructor. Where on the continuum should my course be, but also for institutions? How much should we be still focused entirely on being a face-to-face -face institution? Should we be moving more towards hybrid, or should we be much more moving towards fully online learning? What factors should influence an institution's decision where it should be on that continuum? Um, how do we turn those goals into reality? And in particular, who should make this kind of decision? Who should be involved in decision-making of this kind? So I'm going to put a question to you. And I like to do this because I do this at ev every time I'm presenting on this topic, and I get a better idea of how much this is growing and growing and growing by the number of the hands that go up or don't go up. So does your institution have a plan for learning technologies, a written down plan that is distributed through the institution? Uh, it could be on learning technologies or flexible delivery or online learning, or is it currently developing one? If it's in any of those categories, put up your hand. Right. Oh, it's going to be easy to do it the opposite way. If you don't have one in your institution, put up your hand. Okay, now that's interesting. The majority now are in, do have plans or are in the process. Now, here's a question. For those that do have a plan, is it any good? If it is, put up your hands. Ah. If it isn't any good, put up your hands. Yeah, okay. Well, we'll have a discussion afterwards about why you think it's good or not good, okay? So what do we mean by leadership? Well, my guru on this topic is Henry Mintzberg at McGill. Um, there are several kinds of leadership. And often people think of leadership, particularly in the media, as being charismatic leadership. Churchill or Napoleon or Stalin. Uh, leadership that elicits shock and awe. The problem with that kind of leadership, however, and I actually worked, I've worked for at least two charismatic leaders, um, one particularly the president of the Open University of Catalonia, who actually built it almost from nothing, by, from his own vision. But once they die or leave, the organization often flounders because it's been dependent on that charismatic leadership. More effective over the long run, and particularly more appropriate for your, a university, in, and I'm talking mainly about universities here and not schools and colleges, is a facilitative or collective leadership where the leadership basically tries to fac facilitate others to function more effectively. In other words, you've got a good group of people, let's get them working well together and let's help them. Um, so it's a team approach. But for that to work, a shared vision at the top is absolutely essential. And I have worked at an institution where the VP academic was really for moving forward in learning technologies. And I know there's at least one person from that institute sitting in the audience, so I'm not going to say which one it is. And everything was done, we had a plan, but the VP admin didn't want to spend the money on it. And it never happened. All that planning went to waste, because the VP admin didn't have the same vision for where the institution should be going as the VP academic. So that shared vision is essential for facilitative and collective leadership to work. Incidentally, that VP admin never said once during the planning process that he didn't think the university should go that way. But when it came to getting the money, that's when the, the resistance came. Goals and directions. Main goals for technology in the case studies, and that was a few years ago now, the first thing they wanted to do was put in modern infrastructure. You know, Make sure they've got the internet, got wireless on campus, every faculty member's got a computer, etc. So that was the first thing that most of them did, and that was always the top priority in their technology plans. The second step was to di digitalize the administrative services. And in North America, we went through that in about the end of the 1980s, 1990s. We spent tons of money. Some universities in Australia went broke, putting in PeopleSoft and so on. Spent millions and millions of pounds getting their admin systems up. And then, right at the end, they started to think about using technology for teaching. And most of the 
case studies, we, when we ask them, well, why are you using technology for teaching? To enhance the quality of classroom teaching. And I remember one famous discussion at UBC in 95 when I said, don't you mean to improve the quality? Oh, no, the quality of classroom teaching is already excellent. This is something we can just add a little bit more to. And now I think that's not, that's what I call a weak educational goal because you're adding cost without any discernible benefit. So I think clear measurable goals for learning technologies are essential because they're a major investment. I would reckon now universities are spending on learning technologies alone if you count faculty time, learning technology time, um, et cetera, somewhere around 15 to 20% of their budget now. So that's a substantial amount. And faculty need to know why the university wants them to use learning technologies, and they have to buy into that. And that's the challenge. So what, a, what would be a typical goal? Well, there are lots of different goals. And they often, you, you need to clarify which one is the most important. You can have, you can operate all these goals in parallel, but when it hits the road, where it comes down to the faculty teaching, they need to know why they're doing it. So first of all, increase access to learning, new markets. And for, that's where online distance education is particularly good. And there's a huge market that's still untapped in Canada, and that's the, the credit-based professional development market for those who've already graduated and are out in the workforce. Uh, this is the fastest area of growth in the United States in online learning. It's master's programs for teachers, uh, health service people, uh, engineers, and so on. Online learning, fully, often fully cost recoverable, but credit-based. The second is to increase flexibility. That's not the same as increasing access. Um, you've already got the students, but they're working, they're part-time. They, they're full-time students, but they've got jobs. So you want to make it easier for them to access the teaching. So hybrid learning is a very good way to increase that flexibility. But you're not necessarily increasing access by that. You might get a few more students, but not many, you, because you're still going for the same market. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, that's fine, but it's a different market from increasing access, a different goal. Develop 21st century skills. We could talk a lot about that but I, in another presentation, but not this one. But basically there you're trying to get new outcomes. You're not trying to do the same thing better, but you're trying to focus on more probably on something that may have been less important but is now more important. That's things like problem problem-based learning, getting people to solve problems, uh, thinking critically, um, independent learning skills, because that's what they're going to need when they leave university, etc., etc. Fourth one is to increase student engagement. Make it more interesting. Make it far less boring and sitting like you are listening to somebody talking all the time, but actually getting them engaged in doing something. Individualize the learning, allowing students to find different pathways um, through the learning. Uh, or, and this is never discussed because it terrifies everybody because everybody thinks the, the, the faculty will walk away from it, improve productivity, better outcomes for less cost. And what I mean by that is, let's say we take teaching as being perfect now in Carlton or wherever at 100%. Well, could we get another 10% in improved performance for 90% of the cost that we're spending at the moment? That's productivity. Can we get better outcomes and actually spend a little less money on doing that? Or could we spend the same amount of money and get even better outcomes? That's productivity. Um, and if we're investing in technology, why aren't we asking that question? Um, because that's what most companies invest in technology for, is to get better productivity. Not to save money, that's different. But to get better products, better services, etc. And shouldn't we be doing that in education as well? And the interesting thing about these goals, for me, is they're all fairly easily measurable, except perhaps the new outcomes one, although even that should be fairly measurable. So you can measure whether you're increasing access. You can measure whether you've increased flexibility. You can measure all these things, but we don't do that. And if you're going to be a leader and you want to improve the organization, you've got to have some ways of measuring whether you're successful or not. 
The, the other thing that came out from the studies and comes out of Mintzberg's work particularly, and it really applies to universities, is the importance of strategic thinking. So plans are all right, and we found that institutions that mentioned learning technology in their strategic plan actually had better outcomes in terms of uh, the amount of technology that was being used in teaching. That was fairly easy for us to measure. We just had to ask how many students have Blackboard access, how many faculty are using Blackboard, and so on. And we found that there was greater use when learning technologies was in a strategic plan. One reason for this is it empowers those who want to move in that direction. It gives them permission and blessing to do that. Um, and it also means that because it's in the strategic plan, then resources are identified and allocated to make sure it happens. But more important than a plan, because a plan can go out of date as soon as it's written, is the thinking um, that around the strategy. And in particular, because planning should be ongoing. It shouldn't just be a one-off and then you put the report on the shelf and you try to implement it and then the five years later you do another plan. Um, strategic thinking is ongoing and one way to do that is through the academic planning process. Uh, if your institution has an academic planning process, it should, within that planning process, be looking each year at, from each department or faculty, what programs do they want to offer ne next year, what programs were reviewed and need to be changed, and what resources are needed. It is at that stage that faculty should be doing the strategic thinking about not only what should the content of those programs be, but how they want to teach them, and in particular, how they want to deliver them. Should they be hybrid? Should there be uh, some online courses in the program and so on? So, and that needs getting faculty together and talking and brainstorming about where they want to be. And this should be happening on a, at least once a year, if not more often, in every department. So faculty need to be engaged in setting and implementing goals if you want to get buy-in. And such goals in teaching and learning are best achieved through faculty visioning. The good question to ask them is, you've seen a range of different technologies uses in your department. Uh, so other people have come in from outside and shown you what they're doing. Now let's sit down and think how we'd really like to be teaching in five years' time, knowing what the students are that we're trying to reach and what the possibilities of the technology are, the options are available to us for hybrid or online. How would we really like to be teaching this program in five years' time? That's visioning. Then discussing that, planning programs around that vision, and then that filters down to the individual faculty member designing and evaluating their own courses. So measurable goals, you can put it down something like this. Let's take a broad academic goal like to, to, to make our learning more flexible for our students. You, then you have some strategies. Offer online professional master's programs, more hybrid learning in the undergraduate teaching. And then you can actually identify the intended outcomes. Increase the lifelong learning market, develop financing programs, retain alumni. Make sure the alumni keep coming back and taking more courses from us. And increase link with employers. And then you can have performance indicators against that. Um, but that comes after the strategic thinking. You've got to have the strategic thinking first. Another critical issue we identified, and this, this was true research, we, we, we had no idea, I didn't even know what governance was when we started writing this book. Um, if somebody had asked me to give a definition of governance, I would have thought it's what the Stephen Harper tries to do and so on. But it became apparent when we did these studies that one of the common threads going on was there wasn't a clear governance structure for learning technologies in many institutions. We found that there were gaps. So what we found is that there was a growth of learning technology support units. Now some institutions, Ottawa and UBC I know, have over 60 people now in the Center for Teaching, Learning and Technology, in their centers for teaching, learning and technologies. This is a big growth over the last 10, 10 years. And we also noticed a lot of them had learning technology committees of one kind or another. Sometimes just had just a committee to decide on the learning management system, which seemed to be a very narrow way of looking at learning technologies, but others had much more broader committees. Um, but often these committees had no clear mandates and they certainly had no decision-making authority. All they could do was make a recommendation to the AVP academic. They couldn't, 
Yet these were the people who were in the best position to know what kind of decisions uh, were needed because they were the ones who were actually using technology, were thinking about it, uh, and so on. And then we found duplication and gaps in technology support and decision making. And one of the big problems was lack of clear mandates. And this affected the IT departments particularly. Many of the IT, you saw the history, the IT departments were set up originally to get the infrastructure going and to support the admin side. So I'm working at an institution at the moment, they've got 45 uh, IT staff and they have one dedicated to teaching and learning support, right? Student support as well, one out of the 45 for the whole institution. Um, and then don't be surprised if you want to do mobile learning and the IT department turns around and says, that's not our mandate, that's not in our mandate, our mandate is to keep the servers running and the telephones running. It's not our mandate to come and help you do, do something innovative like move to mobile learning. And that's because the institution hadn't sat down and come up with a common vision and the VP admin wasn't brought on board and said, look, we're going to move in this direction and you've got to start thinking and planning for that because it's going to have a big impact on your department. So you need a clear governance structure for technology that includes teaching and learning. So what is governance? It's a multi-level concept including several different bodies and processes with different decision-making functions. That's a formal definition. Basically, it's who makes decisions about what and how and where are they made and who is responsible once that decision is made. And the functions of governance are pretty clear for learning technologies. You set mission goals and directions, you assign responsibility, you determine decision-making authority, you manage learning technology resources, you manage the risks, and they evalu you evaluate the results and others. And in businesses, they would also have ethics and so on. And this is why it's a problem in many institutions. You have to look at where technology fits. It actually fits right in the middle now between academic and admin. So it's a shared responsibility, and this is why it gets difficult. And so logically, if you look at that, we should have one technology committee that covers both admin and learning technology, so priorities can be set between the two areas. And that means input from both the academic and admin areas, right? And there's two ways of looking at governance. Managerial by position. Does anybody recognize this kind of chart? Yeah. And there's the director of the Center for Learning, Teaching and Learning. And it's often interesting, sometimes you have a CIO up on, this, up on the top level here with a VP and academic, but often they're focused more on the admin side and less on the academic side. It varies, it depends on the institution. UBC at one time moved the CIO from admin to report to the VP academic. And then after several years, they moved him back again when they got a new VP admin. <coughs> But I think the more useful way of looking at it is in the fuzzy way that universities operate, where decisions are made right through the institution, basically. <clears throat> so you have students making decisions about whether they're going to use their mobile phones to access the learning management system or not. Uh, obviously, faculty and instructors are probably the main decision makers when it comes to a specific course about what technology they'll, they'll use. Then there are course decisions made at a course level and there's decisions made at a program level and then faculties make decisions and the executive team makes decisions and the board makes decisions. So, and then on, the, on your left-hand side, you've got the academic planning and strategic planning process. You've got learning technology units and on the right-hand side, you've got IT services and then you may have a technology committee and the executive team may have a special subcommittee in IT governance and so on. So it's a very complicated area and you really need to know which are the best decisions made at which level and make sure you've got the right people there. And the area I want to focus on particularly is program, program areas because I think it's at the program area that key decisions should be made about the mix of flexible online learning and face-to-face -face learning. You should look at it from a program perspective. Why? Because students come in often dependent learners, they're not, often not used to using uh, online learning, and they may need to be moved to that gradually through the program, so that by the time they get to the end of the program, they can take a fully online course as part of their graduate, uh, undergraduate program very comfortably and very confidently, because they've been led into it gradually through the program. 
So I think we need to focus more on programs, and particularly when the academic planning process is taking place, about decisions about learning technologies. So it's the responsibility of the institutional executive. In university, decisions are taken throughout the institution. The right people have to be at the right table. Integrated planning is essential, and it needs to be thought through and formalized. Now, for instance, why not give the technology committee the the budget, a budget to manage. Give the technology committee that budget. In other words, you have a budgeting process and you set aside so much money for technology each year and you mend that each year. And that technology committee actually makes the decisions. It doesn't get forwarded up to an executive that probably doesn't know the issues around the use of that technology, for instance. Um, what are the implications? Well, who should decide on face-to-face, -face, hybrid, fully online? and the choice of technologies on a course. I think the institutions should set the general direction. University of Ottawa said we want 20% of all, all our undergraduate teaching hybrid within five years. That's a general direction. Now, it's going to vary between faculty and faculty, but that's the way you want to go. And that sends a clear message. But it's the program team that should really decide the balance based on target groups, the learning outcomes, uh, the nature of the subject matter, integrated with the annual academic planning and budget process. And then individual faculty within that program plan decide exactly how they're going to use technology at the course level. Don't forget, the, it is the academics, the faculty, that's in the program team. Resource management. This was a real, real, this is a real fun thing. Nobody knew how much it cost to use learning technologies, the real cost. They could tell you the cost of the center, but they couldn't tell you how much time faculty were spending and how many faculty were doing stuff and so on. And what was even more interesting, we would interview a VP academic and say, or a provost, and I asked the provost, where's the money going to come if you want to change your strategy? And they would often say, I don't know, but I know we have to do it, and we'll have to find the money from somewhere. And too often, in up to four years ago, technology was often an added cost for no measurable benefit. And we saw a rapid increase in spending on learning technology units, and that has... When you have a siloed budget, in other words, money goes, a whole chunk goes to the admin side, a whole chunk goes to the academic side, the provost then filters it down to the deans, and the deans filter it down mainly in salaries to faculty and so on. You get unintended consequences when you increase the amount of learning technology support because it's coming out of the provost's budget mainly. So that means he's probably got less money or she's got less money for... Uh, faculty, so you get larger classes, more contract instructors, and increased faculty workload if you're not careful. If you don't do the planning, that's what happens. You start robbing Peter to pay Paul, and then the faculty get really pissed off by this, and they begin to complain how all the money going to learning technology units, and so they get closed down, and we've seen that cycle in many institutions, and then five years later, they have to start them up again. They lost all the expertise, and it's gone. So that's the consequence of not managing the resources properly. As I said, improved productivity is never discussed. It's important to replace activities if you're going to increase the use of learning technologies. That's what hybrid learning is all about. You're replacing some of the face-to-face -face teaching in order to free up the faculty time to do the online stuff. Um, or you increase revenues, as through fully recoverable master's programs going out for new markets. The time of the instructor is the main cost. 80% of most universities and school budgets are paying for the teachers, the instructors. So you need course design models, and we all know this, and I'm, this is what I'm trying to tell the senior administration. You need course design models that control the time and costs. In other words, we should be able to design hybrid or fully online learning so it's less or the same work for faculty and students as a face-to-face -face class. And if we don't design for that, then we're going to run into trouble. And what that really means is shifting from an expenditure-driven budget model. How that works is you, you give money to a department for the year, and the money mustn't spend more than that amount of money. And you track that through the year, and that at the end of the year, you come up with your budget. That's what I call a horizontal approach, because you have faculty, you have expenses, etc., etc., and you track that across the year. 
I'm saying we also need a vertical approach, which is an activity-based approach that looks at, for instance, how much time faculty spend on teaching, how much on research, and if they're teaching, how much time they're spending on face-to-face -face teaching and how much on online. Another way of looking at it, this is an activity-based business plan from UBC. UBC now is asking all programs, new programming, whatever, whether it's credit, undergraduate, or graduate, to come up with a business plan for over the five years. Where the revenue is going to come from, in tuition fees, etc., how many students, etc. And here's one for an online program. This is a master's program online. Planning costs, program administration, development costs, maintenance and delivery. This is for a program, looking at a program activity. Um, and you can see how the costs change. The, the red is program administration. The blue is delivery. And of course, as the course goes on, as the program goes on and more students enroll, the delivery costs go up. But this allows you to work out costs of where, where they're going. In, what's really interesting is the development costs. They're less than 15% of the total cost over seven years. And we have all this focus on reducing um, content costs, you know, MOOCs and all the rest, but it's only 15% of the cost. The real cost is delivery. So if you're looking at productivity, you'd be saying, well, I mean, the, the productivity costs are there are driven by a 1 to 20 student faculty ratio. So are there ways we can use technology to improve the interaction with students, but allow faculty to handle more students? In other words, it's not more work for faculty, but you're increasing productivity by handling more students. So we need that kind of thinking. Another way of looking at it is um, you need to look at revenues as well as costs. I don't know if you can see that pale blue line. This again is from this master's program. Obviously all the cost, the expenditure was in the first two or three years and then it starts to level off. Uh, but look at the revenue. As the number of students build up and the tuition fees come in, and what UBC do, is doing now for the professional master's programs, instead of the money going into the top and then just being distributed anywhere, it actually goes directly to the faculty offering that program, who then pay overheads to the university for all the services that it needs. And this is a real incentive because they can hire new research faculty out of the revenues from that program. Right? So Dealing with institutional culture. The effective use of technology, we all know, requires changes to key processes, and teaching in particular. What are the barriers to change? False tradition. Uh, I call it the, the Socrates syndrome. Socrates sitting under the linden tree with six students around them having a nice chat. That's the image still in many professors' mind of what true university education is about. And it's a myth. It always was a myth. Socrates was teaching the very rich, the very rich. The rest didn't get any education whatsoever. We're not in that business anymore. Um, faculty autonomy, obviously, I don't want to get rid of faculty autonomy, but it's like herding cats, as we mentioned. Lack of incentives for teaching. This is a big, big problem. You know, I, yesterday, a, a, a really dedicated faculty member came up to me and said, I, I buy into everything you say, but I'm not going to do it. And I said, why not? He said, because I get paid for teaching, but I don't get valued for teaching. He says, I can put a lot of work in to teach the way you, you suggest that I should teach, but the university will give me nothing in the way of getting me a tenure track or promotion if I do that. No matter how innovative I am, when I get to that tenure committee, they're just going to look at one thing, research. No matter what it says in all the documents about research and teaching and public service being equal, when it gets to that committee, there's no rewards for teaching. If we don't reward teaching, if we don't have incentives, it's not gonna, you're not going to get the changes you need in the institution. Lack of training in pedagogy, that's a big problem as well. Um, faculty don't get trained in pedagogy. They're experts in research. That's what they're experts in. Um, we wouldn't put a pilot up in a plane without training them, yet we put somebody in front of a 120 students without any training and how to handle that. And, and it's optional. You know, the system's broken. It shouldn't be optional. I don't want an optional pilot. I want a pilot who's actually been forced to do the damn training. And, of course, poor management. Now, I was pleased to see Jo Mighty. I've never seen her. in, But she and um, Julia Christensen Hughes from Queen's 
edited a really good book called Taking Stock. How many of you read Taking Stock? Yeah, it's a, it's a must read. It collects together all the research on university teaching and puts it in a very clear set of chapters. And this is a quote from Chris Knapper, um, who's an old friend of mine, actually. We went to university together. We were in the same psychology t uh, class. There is interesting empirical evidence that prevailing practices in higher education do not encourage the sort of learning that contemporary society demands. However, there's an impressive body of evidence on how teaching methods and curriculum design, uh, curriculum design affect deep, autonomous, and reflective learning, which is exactly the kind of learning we need. Yet most faculty are ignorant of this scholarship, and instructional practices are dominated by tradition rather than research evidence. What a damning indictment of the profession. I mean, you should be ashamed if you're a teacher, a university teacher, and somebody said that about you. You should be outright, downright ashamed. I, I'm, I'm shocked that this is still the situation in our universities. And yet, how can we expect technology to be used intelligently and sensibly unless faculty have some knowledge of how students learn and what, what good, good learning is? Um, and it's the system, not the faculty, who are to blame because they don't get rewarded for it. The need... So there's a huge need for faculty development and training. And that came up through all the case studies. Instructors in most institutions were not adequately prepared to teach well with or without technology. Training of all instructors in teaching should be systematic and compulsory, especially in universities. But in universities, there are systemic difficulties in doing this. I actually said while I was at UBC to the AVP academic, I said, look, if you really want to move in this direction, we have to get into the postgraduate training uh, students, and during their PhD, we should be requiring them to spend at least six to nine months of their PhD program on pedagogical theory and teaching in universities, because if they're going to go on to teach in a university, they should have this knowledge. He said, we can't do that. If we do that, they'll all go to the University of Alberta or Simon Fraser, because they don't have to do that there. And that's what they're going to get rewarded for, is their research, not their teaching. And this is the AVP academic saying this, not the AVP research. So it's a huge problem. And, you know, there's one thing, I hate government regulation of universities, I think it's anathema, but I would actually require, if I was a provincial minister, that every university to get its funding had to have a training program for its faculty that was compulsory for all faculty, or you don't get funded, simple as that. That's the only way the system is going to change. So the traditional faculty development model is broken. If you talk to any faculty development people, they'll tell you the same story. Who we get are the people who, need, who least need the teaching. They're the ones who are good teachers, who are interested, and they come to the faculty development programs. The ones who need it most don't come, and they don't have to come. The other thing is it's really expensive to take a mid-career professional and try to retrain them. That's what we do in faculty development. We try to take somebody who's already well experienced in their, in, 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 in their teaching and pa being paid a high salary, it's much cheaper to take the postgraduate students and take their time and try to get them to learn how to teach than it is to take a, a research professor. So we need to start with those students. And it's not just pedagogy but technology, but also things like teamwork and visioning and planning. These, these are other skills that lecturers and faculty need. So we need some new solutions. <coughs> so some suggestions. What, what can be done? Well, how, how about doing what the University of Central Florida does, it won't let anybody teach online unless they've done their in-house online program on how to teach online. Now, it's a simple deal. You want to teach online, you have to learn how to teach online by taking an online course on teaching online. Very successful, incidentally, University of Central Florida. A training program for TAs and postgrads wanting to teach in post-secondary education. Why not have a provincial-wide program? Wouldn't that make a lot more sense than every institution trying to develop its own? So, and as I said, regulation by government. So, this is all about managing cultural change. Faculty must be part of the solution by understanding the rationales for the use of learning technologies, being involved in decisions about learning technologies at all levels. 
One, one reason I like committees, I'm probably the only person in this room who likes committees, but one reason I like committees, you get an academic research professor and you put him on a learning technology committee and he probably knows nothing about learning technologies, but he learns damn fast because he doesn't want to feel a fool in front of that committee and they, they begin to learn really fast. So you engage them by getting them to make decisions about the technology. Um, working in teams with instructional designers, we all know the value of that being better trained, and finding teaching more fun and rewarding through the use of learning technologies. This is probably the best motivator of all, showing them that it's fun doing this, that students love it, that you'll love it, it gives you a, makes you creative and so on. And I have to say at UBC, our best online teachers are often the top research faculty. And there was lots of reasons for that. First of all, they made their careers. They didn't have to go the publishing route anymore. They were there. Um, they still wanted to publish, of course, but they could step back a little bit and look at their teaching. And secondly, they really knew their subject matter. So they could see, oh yes, I could use that technology in this way. And they would come up with great ideas, but they needed to have that environment where they were questioned about their teaching and could think about it. Now, I've been a very hard on management here. Actually, learn managing is very difficult. Universities in particular are very difficult to manage because of faculty autonomy. It's like herding cats. But all management is messy. Mintzberg did a very interesting study. He followed about 25 CEOs from some of the largest companies in the world and just tracked what they did every day. And it was one damn thing after another. Their average time on dealing with anything was two minutes. Um, because the things just kept coming through. Management, you have to deal with issues. I always remember Martha Piper, the president of UBC. She um, came in three weeks into the job. She got landed with the um, Asian Pacific Development uh, Meeting where people th got pepper sprayed and so on. And she had a student revolt on her hands. She had a, the prime minister's office calling her up. You know, where was the time for her to sit down and say, this is the way I want to move the university? You know, she's putting out fires and she has to. That's the job of a president. Um, so all management's messy. And learning technology is only one new aspect of management. So it's something that institutions are just beginning to realize is a critical, in, uh, critical area. And it's a complicated one because it combines three different cultures all together. It's academic culture, technology culture, and a culture of management. And universities don't like management as an idea very much because they see it threatening autonomy. Then we've got rapid technological change that makes it difficult because as soon as you decide on a learning management system, some damn person comes along and invents another one. And then there is this fear of managerial, managerialism, a resistance to change anyway, naturally, in the institutions. They survive for 800 years and they're going to be damn well not going to want, want to change in case they get destroyed by changing. So, but in conclusion, good leadership is essential for the successful use of technology. Leadership can be found at all levels within an, ins within an institution. Um, in a university, leadership requires teamwork and good governance. And the biggest challenge for leadership is to change entrenched cultures for learning technologies to be used successfully. Thank you very much. Uh, Tony, we do absolutely have time for questions, and I would encourage you uh, to just uh, raise your hand or stand up or and yell out your, uh, your question for Tony. Maxime. Are you optimistic? If so, why? Yeah. <laughs> yes, I am. I'm much more optimistic than I was when I wrote that book uh, because I do, think, do see things changing. And I hate to say it because I don't like them, but I think MOOCs are to blame for the, for the change because it's it, they, it spooked governors and the governors are spook, starting to spook the administration and the administration's reaching down to people like Richard and the other learning technology people to say, we need your help. So yes, I'm very optimistic for that reason. Um, I think also there is, um, what's happened is that we've had particularly distance education out in continuing studies. Now it's, it's moving right into the core of the university and that's forcing faculty to deal with the issues, which were they, they've been only too happy in the past to palm off to, to continuing studies to worry about. 
And in fact, I think for continuing studies, it's more of a challenge because uh, let's look at the professional master's program. Now, okay, so you'd say to a faculty, now you're going to run this and you can actually make some money and hire more professors and so on. And they're going to start saying, well, wait a minute, if, why don't we reduce risk and just offer a few courses for non-credit and see what happens? And then if we get five courses, we'll offer a certificate. And then if that works, we'll offer a master's. The faculty is now taking back what continuing studies has done traditionally. Um, and it will make more sense for them to do that. But on the other hand, they don't have the marketing skills, they don't have the knowledge of the market often that continuing studies has. So it means institutions, if they're moving in this direction, has to really th rethink its re uh, continuing studies and its relationship with the university. And it's interesting because continuing studies at one time was all about non-profit and representing the institution in the community and so on. And all that went by the board when universities became more business oriented, continuing studies had to make money. And now I think we, it's just starting, we're gonna see that pulling back again. Yes, please. The term disruptive technologies, the term disruptive technologies. Yep. Uh, I think the real, the real problem is what are the core values of a university? And those core values for me are an emphasis on rationality, evidence-based research, et cetera, et cetera. Now, will the technologies disrupt that? I'd be very, would MOOCs get, get, get out of that, get universities out of that business because it would make their teaching irrelevant? No, I don't think so. I don't think so. So what we have to work within is those core values of the university and protect those core values, but at the same time using technology to make, make it more effective and more productive in meeting those core values. I think that's the challenge. So it's not disruptive technology, it's sustaining technology, bringing technology in to sustain the core values of the institution. Now. Teaching is an interesting, what might happen is that we might get to the, where we start separating research and teaching. Or we only have teaching at a graduate level, and not, a, not an undergraduate level. So we might see some disaggregation in that area. Um, you know, I, if, if you ask most of the faculty at UBC, do you want to teach first and second year programs? They would say no. Let's get rid of them, right? Let the, let the small colleges, let small universities deal with that. You know, it's a waste of our time as research professors because you don't get that anywhere. So I think that, might, that kind of thing might happen. So yes, there will be some disruption, but I don't think it will be disruption of the core values because society needs institutions like that despite what Stephen Harper thinks. Oh, sorry, I didn't say that. <laughs> Right. So I was just wondering, what do you think students can do from our point of view to get our departments and our faculties and our yeah. universities to promote that? Yeah, well, that's a very difficult question. But I, I think definitely, you know, ask, ask, for, tra ask for training. Say, look, I'm going to my make it clear. If you want me to work in the university later on as your, your grad student and so on, and you want me to teach, I have to be able to do both sides of that equally well. And I, I think all you can do is to pressure your, your professors on that. Um, you know, some, some research professors do understand the issue, but others don't because, you know, it's the system they came up through and, you know, it worked for them, so why wouldn't it work for you? You know, it's like, <laughs> like the old residency thing for registrars, you know, let them drop dead on the job because I had to do it, you know. It's that attitude. And, you have, I'm not, and that is changing. Um, and so I think, I think pressure from the... Get, organize, your, organize your grad student colleagues together and and then draw up a, a, a statement and take it to the head of department and say, this is what we want. <laughs> and good luck. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Anne. Tony, um, one of the, you know, I, I no longer think that a technology 
technology is the disruptive factor. I think it's the marketplace. So in a demand-driven system, um, I think that what we're going to see is real pressure on what institutions will survive um, in terms of um, being able to respond to the quality or the changing types of learning that the community is going to demand. Do you see that as a, an issue um, in, in Canada? Uh, I think my answer to that question is that we need more diversity in the system. Um, we need more options for students. Um, I can, I mean, we do have some diversity, in, in, certainly in British Columbia, we have a variety. We have one very big research university on, on a global scale. We have two, uh, two universities with very good research, comprehensive universities with research records. And then we have smaller regional universities that do a very good teaching job and then students transfer in to the big research universities at graduate level. Uh, I, I don't see that diversity, interestingly, so much in Ontario. You have this real distinction between colleges and universities on the one hand, and all universities wanted to be like each other on the other. Um, and I think there needs to be more diversity in the Ontario system, for instance. Um, and I think the minister wants that as well. I think the government wants that. But how you get that is difficult, because everybody wants to be the University of Toronto, and you can't. Uh, sorry, there's uh, the gentleman right, is it a lady, I think, right at the very, I can't quite see from here. This is distance education. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> oh, it's Marty. Hi, Marty. <laughs> Okay, I think my, my, that's a very good point, and I, I think you should go to Marty's session to hear how she's going to solve that one. Here's what I would say. I, say, I, I would agree, we need both. The problem I have with having an instructional designer for every faculty member is we can't afford it. It's as simple as that. Um, yes, faculty do need that kind of support, but... First of all, they have to recognize they need that support in the first place. And if they don't get some kind of introduction to pedagogy and so on, they're not aware even that there's an issue here. Right? So, so that's the first point. But the second point is I'm worried about these creeping costs for learning technology units. You know, UBC now has got over $10 million being spent on learning technology. They're starting now to decentralize that so every faculty has their own learning technology support units. This is getting to be a big cost. And at some point, some VP academic is going to come in and say, I can't afford this. We have to find a better solution. Now, the other thing is that you don't need instructional design support throughout the career of an academic. I've, w my experience doing distance education with, with research faculty is that you put an instructional designer with them for maybe one or two courses, and then they pick it up pretty quickly. It's not rocket science, and then they're much more able to manage on their own. 
But nevertheless, you've got to get them into the position where they accept that they need help. And that's often a big challenge. Yes, please. First, thank you for your talk. That was wonderful. And you, in your talk, you mentioned uh, university leadership being spooked by MOOCs. Uh, can you unpack why you think that is? And then what advice do you give them in terms of how should universities in Canada uh, be approaching the question of uh, what to do with MOOCs? <laughs> Okay, uh, why are they spooked by it? It's because Harvard and Stanford are doing it. That's why they're spooked. Um, and to be honest, and I, and I hope I'm not going to upset co my colleague from the University of Toronto here, the, the, the really elite universities, particularly in the US, less so in the Canada, but particularly in the US, were very slow getting into online learning, right? So they're 10, 15 years behind. And this is their way of jumping ahead. Um, by following what Stanford and Harvard are doing and MIT. And so that's why it spooked the institutions. Once, once Harvard and MIT went this route, they felt, well, maybe we should be going this route. And it's a terrible, terrible motive for doing a MOOC, I tell you. Um, but that's the way the herd... I mean, the universities are like elephants. They're very big and they move in a herd. When one moves, they all follow. Um, so the main thing is to, first of all, get the elephant moving, but even more difficult is pointing it in the right direction. <laughs> and the last thing you want to be is an instructional designer who's right behind the elephants. 